Hello. Oh, camera did not work. Okay. Um, as fun, always fun. It was working just a second ago. And now the camera's disappeared. Let me see what's going on here. Sorry for the live technical issues. Oh, I ran the opening sequence button, and the camera disappeared. Go turn off. Alright, we are going to be up and running um, shortly. In the meantime, what we are is a, uh, D a uh, 3D printing, painting show. Um, you can see my hands here, at least. Hello. Oh, there we go. We're live. All right. <laughs> Sorry about the awkward start, everyone. Um, welcome to our D and D painting show. Thank you very much. We are putting together a small set here today for a test batch for an upcoming Etsy store. Um, and what we are making today is going to be a little magic shop. This magic shop was voted on by our patrons as our first one that we're going to put together. So if you're interested in having a voice, I am going, I think today I have another poll going out actually about what color we're going to be painting this magic shop. So if you want to have a voice in what's going on in all of our painting streams, check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash dice and dungeons. That's with an and. And um, there are periodic polls. You might, at certain tiers, you get to interact. You get to, sorry? Can I steal you for a minute? Oh, my father is being borrowed for a minute while I do the introduction. <laughs> sorry. Um, our Patreon, uh, we run polls for this show. We run polls for our video game streams periodically. It's brand new. We're still working out some kinks, adding new content. All sorts of things like that. Um, and on this show, we like to paint. This is a weird mushroom I'm working on. Sort of in progress. Um, but today we are gluing together a magic shop. If you're interested, these models, the designers are all listed on our website. Hi, you, Jim on DiceAndDungeons.com under the Attributions page, so you can check them out. Um, and we're going to be doing some gluing. So the only piece here that doesn't need gluing, this is a little cool magic circle, as you can see. Everything here is hot off our 3D printers that are running behind me right here um, that you can see. And we 3D print ourselves. These are on primed, on glued. Nothing, nothing happened to them yet. I'm gonna set this guy aside because we don't need to glue them. I just wanted to have a look at one of the pieces that's gonna be in our magic shop. It's a very pretty magic circle. So set that over there. And what we're going to do is a bit of a process, and I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, Basically, every single piece is going to sit on one of these bases or one of these bases. Um, each of these bases will have, here's an example, uh, a floor. We have a stone floor for our magic set, a little fancier than a wood. Um, and then here, I have a pile that I'm spilling we have some window walls. So these get glued together like that, and they create a dungeon tile set that we use these in our D&D game that we stream here on this channel, Dyson Dungeons and Twitch. It's twitch.tv forward slash Dyson Dungeons with an N. And um, we're looking at maybe expanding into an Etsy market with these. So this is sort of what the final piece looks like. Um, obviously, all glued together and primed and everything. But um, that's where we're going with this. And our first step is we magnetize these so that the each P tile will hold another tile together. Um, to do that today, 
We're using little ball magnets, and these will slot in each of these holes around here. Um, so, Dad, do you want to take that half? Do you want to do squares or curves? Oh, just give me some. Just give you some. There's fewer in the curves, so if you beat me. Well, I will, because there's only five of these and there's four holes in each. And there's nine <laughs> squares. So, let me move some of my parts here. We have these curved walls that we also 3D printed. Um, so, you can see how those go. We also have a couple little counters that we're going to glue together. These aren't magnetized but they'll provide a little extra something. What about nines? <laughs> well, nines can go in the magic shop, look around, decide he doesn't want to pay for any of it, and then just leave. Unless there's something on deep discount. Uh-huh, deep, deep discount. In which case, nines Ma will buy it regardless of how bizarre and awful it is. So remember, players, if you're ever, um, and let me actually update this little bit here. You're going to see a little live update happening. Um, what did I do? Just turn this off? <laughs> no, there it is. No, you're fine. I had a pop-up up. Mm. What uh, we're going to be doing today, I'm actually just going to hide our little today's models thing because I forgot to update it today. So that's gone. All right. <laughs> so we take each one of these little balls, drop them into these little slots, like you're seeing on both of our cameras. Um, the key with these is to not let them pull each other out of the bases, which they look really like doing. I'm demonstrating um, that now, see? And these will all be securely locked in when there's pieces glued on top of them. So, we are going to go one at a time. And then you want to have them stored somewhere where they're accessible but not near each other because they will yank each other out of the uh, pockets. Mm -hmm. Would the viewers like to see how that works? You can demonstrate if you're feeling courageous. Yeah, watch. Just pull them right out. And they even stick to the bottom. There we go. So. These are uh, new base from what we used previously. Um, they're newly designed so that they can take these balls or they can also take little magnetized discs, which are a little easier to get because um, in the U.S. here, these are considered a choking hazard and are kind of becoming hard to find because I think there's a push to um, make them non-saleable here in the U.S. because apparently kids swallow them. Yeah, they look kind of like candy, actually. Well, with the bright colors, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nines would definitely eat one of these, I'm pretty sure. Who? You said, who Who? 28 saying they, they do look delicious. <laughs> and that is what you can't see what just happened, luckily. But, but like three that is why I like to sort of organize them more as a grid rather than just shove them off to the side because it gives you a little that one wasn't even close a little more control so you get to see a little extra bonus footage of my magnet application because they you know we got out. too close I don't know magnetized pretzels mm, no one nice part of these is that if you accidentally drop one you can just look at the closest metal thing and it's probably there or just you know 
scan around with what magnets you have in your hand to see, and they'll pop back in. All right, so. Do you want to start with the hardest ones or the easiest ones? Let's do the hardest ones first. <laughs> That's what happens sometimes. So, would you mind grabbing that jig back there so I can display once I get it, how the process? So I'm going to be up and running around a little bit here. Um, and you're going to be seeing my father, Olseth, who plays Olseth on our D&D stream here, uh, working the glue. We're going to use a five-minute epoxy to attach everything together. It gives a nice firm hold without taking an eternity. All right, so we're all magnetized. You're going to demo this? Yeah, well, loosely. <laughs> so this is just a simple jig we built. Um, what we'll do is take one of these bases. I'm not going to use it right now because it has magnets in it. But you will assemble it to be fully glued together. And then you can sort of slide it up against here to help make walls 90 degrees. Make sure it's all stable. Or you can also slide it in here to get a full squaring effect to sort of make sure everything is even and nice and straight. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be on my feet running around doing gluing. You'll see me running around all over there. You'll see me mixing little puddles of epoxy here. And applying them. Applying little dollops and occasionally reaching for the isopropyl alcohol, which is uh, the cleaning agent for the epoxy before it's set. And why don't you pull that tray out? So the, uh, the white we, tray? So that we don't get alcohol on the table. Mm hmm right, I'm trying to reach things. I'm just assembling a small drying area. I'm putting, we have a metal counter. And I'm putting um, plates down, or paper down, so that any glue that might actually spill over isn't here. So uh, this is our high-tech mixing pad. Now for the door here, we are not going to be gluing these two pieces yet. We want to be able to paint the door fully before we glue it into place with the topper. But it goes like that glues in and holds the door in place on a hinge so that it opens and closes. But we will be doing the frame and the floor. So I'm setting those two aside so that they're not in the way. Okay. I think just because they're a bit of a menace, let's start with these walls, these curved walls. So we'll go for curved pieces okay. here. This is the epoxy part. And what I try to do is mix enough so that we can get, oh, maybe five or six of them done before it sets up too far. My if it main... sets up too far, then it doesn't adhere. And my main goal with each of the walls is to make sure, and these curved ones look fine around. So, hard, no? so, on each of the walls, this is a Tudor set, it's called. Um, it has a wood beam about a third of the way up, and I want the higher, though, it to be on the lower part, so, so that it sits like that against the floor, and then has a larger plaster area up above. It's a little hard to see before it's been primed. Did we get that new prime color, by the way? Not yet. That hasn't arrived yet. All right. And if we get through all these, um, I could actually prime them once they set, but we also have a few other little projects that we can paint and work on. 
in the meantime, yeah, if we these go... These bottles are getting close to being empty, so they're yeah. harder right. to so extract. The way a five-minute epoxy works is there is the epoxy and a hardener, one of which smells awful, that being the hardener. Um, they're sort of stable in their two individual components, but when you mix them in a 50-50 ratio, the hardener starts to harden the epoxy. Um, in this case, within five minutes, there's other time, time uh, things for um, epoxy. You can get, like, I think 10-hour epoxy, 24-hour epoxy. Just stuff about, like yeah. All sorts of varieties. Um, we're using five because it gives us enough time to work without running the risk of long-term damage. Yep, so we're doing these curves first. Because they're, they like to slide around. They're a little bit of a pain. Yep, so basically we're just uh, applying it to the edges. Yeah, he applies dollops of glue. He'll place them over here by me. And I will get them all situated together, move them over to the drying area, make sure they're straight, all that sort of stuff. No. And you have to be very careful in moving them because they will pop out, pop out, which causes a lot more problems when there's drying glue a current happening. In them. Yeah, these holes don't hold the. And now my fingers are real nice and gluey. I will get you some cleaning. So, I do a rough assembly here, and then I'm going to move it over. There's the alcohol saturated. Um, paper towel. Oh, just be careful about the table. Alright. That won't hurt the paint. That gets my fingers clear. Oh, it did before. It did? Really? Yeah, that's the thing that damaged the paint a little bit. Huh. It's just some bleed through of alcohol. Bleed through alcohol? Uh -huh. I would have thought that the paint would have held up to that. Don't wash your latex paint. With denatured alcohol. And I try, my job is to be both precise and quick. So I can get a little intense sometimes. We went with these curved walls because it just felt a lot more magic shoppy to me. Let's shop. S H O P P E E. Shoppy. Right? Magic M I J K I K E. You want to do a couple of uh, squares? I think I've got enough for. Yeah, that's fine. Like Sorry. two. All right. I try to approach us from the inside of the square because you get these little threads of epoxy. My fingers get very covered with epoxy down. <laughs> All right, um, I have to make a quick decision about what we're putting together. So this is an inside corner. Um, it's just a floor with a small wood pillar like that, and it operates like an inside corner. Thank you. 
Okay. And then we also have a single wall. There might be enough here for another one, but it's setting up so much that it's just not going to appear. So, so that's the end of that one. Yeah, okay. I have, oh, I lost one magnet. Yeah. There you go. These holes are a little bigger than the ones we've been using before. They're made to accommodate two types of magnets. So. So they kind of pop out a little bit sometimes. So when Nikki's ready, I'll mix up another batch. Well, I haven't even gotten it out yet. So. Okay, so I'm going to take a minute to clear the huge amount of gunk that's gotten all over my fingers. If you need more, I've got some here. So, the next thing batch we have is um, four windows with floors, a door frame with a floor, two solid floors, which are just for these are the easiest ones. And then if we have it, we will attach these countertops to these counters. That's the plan. I'll save the easiest for last, because um, I like to do that. My main thing is, I think uh, the magic shop should open indoors into the room. Don't you think? Yes. Yeah, the door should open in. So I just want to be mindful of where this... Uh, little extra bit of plastic is that holds the door in. They might be the last day for those options. Break out the new stuff. <sighs> okay. start with these the main thing with the wall segments is making sure that they're at a 90 degree angle so you're not getting any wobble back and forth that's the the most sort of pressing design element yeah hopefully that jig will be helpful that way It's actually a lot easier when they start when it starts to set slightly because you have a little more support. Um, it's a little slidey when it's so fresh. Mm These take a minute longer to get set up, so I might get a little behind. Well, I'll do my best to uh, be a sloth today, move slowly. I can't hear you. But I'll do my best to be a sloth and just move slowly today. One problem I'm running into with the jig is that it needs to be cleaned regularly or else it starts to just be sticky and hold the wall to itself. 
Uh huh. Because of the epoxy. What we could do is maybe line it with wax paper. That might help. I also think I need to clamp it to the counter or so somehow because the jig itself will slide. We'll slide around. Yeah. But it's a new process we're developing right now. So these ones are easy at least. Just the basic floors. So did you want these? Yeah, right along the top there. Uh, here? Yeah. Can you tell the top from the bottom? Uh, yeah, that's the bottom. That's the bottom? Yep. So I want the top. Yep. Got it. And these counters are a little more freeform because you have to sort of determine where. Um, how far this forward is it sits. Right? Yeah. So, I'm putting these roughly middle-ish. I'm going to even them out on the sides. There we go. Okay, that was just enough to accomplish that task. And I want them to be roughly equal with each other. Uh. You get to watch um, epoxy dry. Pretty exciting. Okay, and that should not take that long to dry. Um, in the meantime, do you want to do a little painting? Sure. We can do painting. Okay. So, um, the big things we have to paint are not a whole lot Getting right this now. Tree out of the way. I have my mushroom tree still. Um, we have this fireplace that we're looking at adding into our ta upcoming tavern set. And we also have this cute little barrel chair. These are just little scatter pieces. Very fun. So if you want to... Oh. You know, there's just something on the table there. Okay. And now it's gone. It was brown. Like dirt. So if you're interested in doing these pieces... Yeah. I think from the looks of it, there's like wood. It does look like wood. Here and here. Mm -hmm. And then this is stone and stone in here. And then if you want, you can do some like fun little smoky black effect, like ash yeah, yeah, really inside. Inside with wash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the back, what should I do? Should just, I should just paint it maybe the stone color in case it shows? Yeah, I would just paint it stone. Okay. Did you grab an extra water? Or just the one cup. I just had one. Well, I forgot to bring down the other one. No, I meant. Oh, that paint water. Um, no, take that. I'll get one. I only brought one in, and I knew we were epoxy. So, so. yeah. <laughs> um, it looks like we'll be uh, repainting the surface again soon. You know, good, good thing we have extra paint. There's bound to be paint splatters on any. Okay. So, question. It's always a color selection issue. I'm thinking red brown for the wood with the umber wash. Yeah, and then a neutral gray, maybe. Yeah, you know, we have a lot of nice neutral gray. Yeah. And I'm red gonna. Brown. 
paint the tree, except my uh, gloves disappeared from where I had them stored. There are some here. I got put over there. Great. Everything. Okay. I'm going to uh, get some water. Get some water. Get the gloves. You set up. Everything's in a different place. <laughs> yep. We're relearning our whole system. Uh -huh. So. We, there's the picture, right? I knew it was somewhere. All right. Do a little camera adjustment. Okay. Put With this piece, backwards. I'm going to use this holder stick to hold the piece for me. Um, yeah, I think I'll paint the, the wood part first and then the gray. I'm going to keep painting my weird mushroom. I've been putting red striations along it and then I'm going to be doing a whole bunch of fun shading and various coloring in. I haven't decided what the ground color is going to be yet, but I'll do that near the end. So. And then, yeah, I'll probably, uh, the airbrushing, I can't be here. Can you eat the weird mushroom? Well, it's about, in D&D &D terms, it's maybe 20 feet tall. So you probably couldn't eat it all in one go. I expect. So I have a lot of stock here to do, um, as you can see, and I am doing it in Scarlet Red. That's what the name of the paint is. So I'm just going to do a couple drops at most at a time, because it will dry in the container and I don't really want to waste the paint. And since this is such an amorphous sort of model, there's a lot of just sort of freehanding that happens here. You just sort of have to go with the flow, figure it out. Yeah. As so you... I'll be using the paint from the bottle cap first. Waste that one, that. Or something like that. The general vibe I'm going for with these is just sort of like loosely perpendicular lines. Oh, that's not good. And just fill in various sections. As I'm painting this, I'm realizing that the boundary here between the wood in the front and the stone in the back means you would be painting from the back toward the front. So I'll be doing a fair amount of touch up right along that line after I put the gray down. And if you're interested in seeing the start of this weird mushroom and how I got to where I am now, um, the video is currently uploaded on our YouTube channel. It should be in the links below. Um, we upload all of our various painting and bluing and D&D &D and video games. We do a whole lot of things on this channel. And almost all of it is uploaded on YouTube, so feel free to check that out and subscribe there if that's something you are interested in. So I don't want super consistent lines because I'm going for kind of an odd organic look. And I also have to do a lot of really awkward reaching in and through. Luckily, this part inside here isn't going to be very visible. 
<laughs> yeah, that's what I'm going for, is a very bizarre alien tree. And it's going to look even weirder as I shade it in later. Okay, so there's the wood part. Now, I'll rough in the stone part. That's where to deal with the edges of things. Watch me wash the brush. It's pretty exciting too. All right. I want to try and get as much of this inside, in between all these stalks that I can, just for the sake of having it done. I'm going to start with the hardest part first, which is the inside of the hearth here, trying to follow that line where the wood is. The wood is raised up a little bit, so painting it in that way was fine, but you know, getting the gray in there without getting it onto the wood is probably not going to happen. Yeah, you might want to start with the wood instead, going in the future. With the stone. With the stone, I mean, yeah. It's not awful, but it will require a little touching up. Alright. So what I'm doing right now is basically um, the middle step of any model that I paint. I like to start with a nice quick, easy base coat, which just helps me define where all the colors are. And then I like to go in and do various detailing, which is what I'm doing here, to get some more fine definitions for like where color transitions are, things like that. Um, add in more specific details like red lines or these uh veiny green bits i did all over the bulbs just basic things like that and then i move into a cleanup phase where i fix all of my mistakes before i shade and finish the piece that's sort of my basic step-by-step -step process that I, I do for things like this. And I ended up doing like a light beige for the uh, body of the trunk here. Just, I don't know, it felt kind of pallid and fleshy to me. Uh, you know, like, you know, that weird organic feel. Maybe read this slightly unhealthy and... invoke feelings of something being sort of sick. Mm. Nine's food. Nine's food? Mm-hmm. Why, because he would eat this? Oh, yeah. Nine's is our uh, party bard in our D&D game, who is a very smart and makes good decisions all the time. Right? Whenever a decision is not made, Nine's decision is usually pretty good. One should only question Nine's judgment if a decision is actually made. Okay. 
Okay. Reaching in between these stocks is a bit of a pain, but I'm getting through it. There's a lot of uh, good stone detail here. But that means that the brush needs to get in all those little crevices. I do a lot of backup and check, see where I've done, where I need to do, see if I've missed any locations, things like that. I find that quite valuable when you're doing a piece that's oddly shaped, especially like this. Um, just step back, reassess where you're at, everything like that. can help quite a bit. I'm mostly painting this not because we have any specific plans to use it, but because it was one of an early tests we did, and we just had it sitting around for a long time now. Then I wanted to do something with it rather than just throw it away, so here it is. It has a lot of real awkward bumps and curves in it, too, which makes it very odd to paint. Especially when you're painting stripes all along it. Which is something people do a lot with trees, I imagine. Mm -hmm. So this is designed to be put up against the wall, but I'm going to paint the back of it anyway, just in case for some reason it should show. It's got a lot of print texture on it, so it's actually going to be kind of a pain to paint. It's real ridgy. And once I hit a little bit, I'm going to go grab the um, models we just glued together and give them some time to dry. It is a five-minute epoxy, so by now they're probably handleable. Handleable? Um, but, you know, I'm just going to give them a little extra curing time just to be safe. So there's no need to rush. And then I'm going to assemble it, make sure I glued it all together correctly. So this just big textured thing in the back, I'm going to pull out a bigger brush. This will just, which somehow or other ended up getting very stiff, like it didn't get cleaned well. Hmm. That brush? Yeah, something was in it. I don't know, I haven't used that one in ages. No, I was using it. Anyway, some water, a little isopropyl alcohol, and it comes pretty clean. Weird though, whatever it was was very transparent.
when I'm done with this. I don't want to let this sit in some alcohol because something's gummy in it. Really weird. You don't think it got a little glue in it, do you? I don't think so. Working okay now, but I'm rushing along with the uh, grain of the printing here. With this bigger brush, and as you can see, it goes much more quickly than that little one. Mm -hmm. So we're going to let this dry, and then I'm going to um, do some black wash on the stonework, because that's likely to get all over the wood. And then I'll touch up the wood after that. Seems like a reasonable course of action. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm going to let that set. And that can dry. And I'm going to clean this brush. So I'm going to be away for just a few minutes. Well, I'm going to clean my brush and take a look. Uh, it's been like five, over five minutes now, right? Oh, yeah. Way past five Way minutes. Way past five minutes. I lose a lot of track of time painting sometimes. So I'm going to quickly clean my brush off. This is, you know, I'm getting along on this odd alien tree. And I'm going to do a bunch of shading up and down it, and inside the uh, bulbs here. But I'm going to set that aside for a minute, get my brush cleaned, and I'm going to pull over and inspect our newly painted thingies. Set. Why don't you rinse that out while I'm, if you're going into the bathroom. I could do that. Okay. Uh, it doesn't adhere to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Too much. That's the alcohol. Save that. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Let's see what we got. They're still slightly sticky on the sides where the epoxy came through. So I'm going to keep them separated for a longer period, but I'm going to clean this cup. I'll be right back. I'm going to do a little pullback on the camera here. And as I got all the pieces assembled. Okay, and then we have a snow circle. <laughs> Alright, so. Oh, hey, Just Hey. Hey, hey, Just Hey. How's it going? I am pulling out a little with my camera here. It's probably blocking my face up above. Not too bad. Um, these are. A dungeon set we just assembled. They're unprimed and unpainted right now, so they still have some work to do. But we have a little doorway here. I remember the layout from our task. The nice part about these is they're yeah, exactly. Um, and we're gonna have to make some decisions about colors and everything, of course, but. Going forward, um, this is just a cute little magic shop that we have. And these are all very conveniently magnetized, so they help pull together, make all the color, just the whole thing blue completely. Yeah, that might work. That's a very nine sort of... Uh, <laughs> choice. So you have these nice windows. 
And I think... Uh, like... That. And these are all magnetized, so they help hold each other together, so you can move them around, and they help snap into place and everything. <laughs> That's a really nice color choice. Um... We have some counters, these little counters here. So you can put a little counter, and then I have a nice spell circle. It's not primed or painted yet, so uh, it's a little hard to see, but you can have maybe behind the counter they have a place where they do their enchantments. So here's a little uh, version of our, um, magic shop. And, uh, I don't have a ton of maneuverability on my camera here, but it's a sort of a stone floor with all those curved walls. It's a cute, nice, cute little set, basically. What do you think? I think it is. And we don't have the door in yet, obviously. Um, that is something that we do post, uh, post painting. So, it's easy to pull apart, and the great thing about dungeon sets like this is, um, that are magnetized like this is you can pull them apart and reconfigure them, so that's just a design that we originally designed with it, but you could easily make, like, a a big bay window, like that. Maybe have it go, you know, I don't know, I'm just playing with it right now. But, uh, inside corner. Here's another little random layout that I um, this is randomly laid out. Growing together. Suddenly, and I'm not even using this piece, um, you have a whole nother magic shop. You know, you, I mean, you definitely can put glitter on the walls. That is 100% an option. Like that, maybe. See, so, so you have all sorts of cool little design options with a set like this, even a small one. It's nowhere near as big as that dungeon set we did. Um, you're doing a fire okay, place, right? So I'm waiting for this to dry. It's still, you can see there's some shiny bits on it. So Glitter it's makes dry. everything yeah. magical, that's right. And I'm going to do a very light wash on the stonework to bring out the, oh, the individual stone uh, detail. And then play around with the inside of the fireplace so that the, the scent you know where the fire is is much darker. So it looks like, you know, a fireplace should. And then I'll uh, do some touching up on the brown, the wood parts, and then, um, I don't know, umber wash might work on that. So I might do quick, actually. Should I just airbrush these? It's pretty loud. That is true. You won't be able to hear anything going on. No, it's, the compressor. It, it uses brush. compressor. So, I'm going to set these to the side, and after we're done streaming, I'm going to airbrush them with a primer. But I feel like these turned out very nice. I'm, yeah, they look I'm good. quite happy with them. Um, so, the sigil. We're actually going to be, speaking of colors, this sigil. Yeah, I'm just thinking about how... Um, I mean, how much detail do you want to do on this? This could take forever to paint. Speaking of uh, sigils, though, I, I'm actually planning, I think it might have been posted, I have a little poll going on our Patreon for what color this magic shop was going to get painted. I have a few color options. Um, and what are the options? I think I had, like, a white plaster using this ivory. Mm -hmm. I had um, blue. A nice royal blue, for the green part? for the plaster. Uh huh. Like they painted the walls. Yeah, the plaster uh, part is this part here. Yeah. Between the wood so there's bits. wood beam and plaster. 
Um, and then I also have purple as an option. Mm -hmm. What so, about the floor? The floor is stone. Yeah, so that's just going to be stone. So that's probably going to be a gray stone, most likely. Mm -hmm. um, and the wood will be wood. And the wood will be some sort of wood. It'll, I'll probably choose the wood color depending on what um, color the walls get chosen to be. Mm -hmm. But if you want to take part in our polls, we have our Patreon up and running now, which is patreon.com forward slash dice and dungeons. But, and if you're not part of Patreon, you have no say, <laughs> none at all, about but, the color. That um, they're also the ones who decided we would do the magic shop first. Um, for example, I think after the magic shops are done, we're going to do, I think it was decided necromancy crypts, mm. the, the necromancer crypts. And uh, as Nines has taught us in our D&D stream, the main thing to do in a magic shop is ask them what are their discount magic <laughs> items. You always ask for the discounts. You know, I just want to see what their discount magic items are because they're always going to be. You can get some weird stuff, like maybe a slightly cursed magic item, things like that. So remember, if you're ever in a magic shop, ask what their discounts are. Um, so in the near future, though, you'll be seeing us probably Tuesday. We'll be um, painting this magic shop which should be quite exciting. Um, since I don't want to run an air compressor, though, and blast everyone's ears, and I just realized our music has not been playing because I had to run a restart on our system. Oh, no, no music. And our music wasn't up and running. So I'm going to fix that quick, but I'm going to keep painting my weird mushroom tree thing here. Um, okay, and I'm going to start putting black wash on this. I'm going to try to do it really lightly all around the outside, the sides, and the back. And then I'm going to play with the inside of that a little later to see if so, I can. And if it doesn't work, I'll just paint it gray and start over. This mushroom, alien mushroom tree that I've been painting, um, I'm putting in these red veins along it, which are going to get shaded and washed over, so... Everything won't look quite so bright and flat when I am done. And I'm planning to put some washing in between all of these green lines to tone down this yellow a little. But I'm going to use a green wash, I think, to do that, to play into the sort of alien fey. I don't know. I, this is just a weird model we had sitting around for ages, and I wanted to get through it. But, um,. Yeah, so I'm going to keep going with this red and just get like a drop or two in my cup here. Um, see how far I get in the next hour or so. Um, probably won't see this particular piece unless we do something really weird, but almost all of the pieces we paint here we use in our D&D stream that we do on Sundays at 2 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, so... Feel free to check us out. That would be great if you did. Um, otherwise, you know, just maybe hang out, chat, listen to some music. And we're going to keep painting. Um, I'm doing this sort of like rough freehand because I want this to sort of feel like a very bizarre kind of mushroom tree. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is I'm painting, but I'm just going to keep going until I have some finished product. I have some ideas brewing um, for what it's going to look like in the end, but who knows? It'll probably change as time goes on. I'm going to put some black wash on that. We didn't see how that Okay. It should look good. I don't think the umber will show up on this color very well. Which, uh, which brown did you use? Red brown. 
Yeah, I find the flat brown and red brown, but especially the flat brown, it just sort of absorbs the umber wash. It doesn't really show. And what you're looking for are probably to bring out the yeah, show some of the wood the wood grains that are printed into it. And these are all 3D models that we print here on those machines that they just finished behind me recently. Um, so we'll need to get those started again soon. But we 3D print everything here and then uh, do all the work to paint it and make nice finished models that we can use. Um, and if you ever want to see like, uh, how did they do that model? Or like, with this alien tree I'm doing, what were my first steps in it? Well, the previous episodes are on our YouTube channel, so you can find them all there and uh, sort of see the uh, process from the beginning to end. Um, pretty much outside of the priming process because that's loud. We use an airbrush to do a lot of our priming because it's just, it's not only cheaper to buy um, primer for an airbrush if you have an airbrush, um, but you know, it it's just a little easier to do large batches than having to use a can. Um, but <laughs> airbrushes are not the cheapest thing to just pick up. So if you want to get into model making, there's absolutely nothing wrong with grabbing a, a can of primer. As long as you are using it in a well-ventilated space, you don't really want to be inhaling that. So go outside or something if you're going to prime some figures. Um, because you do not want to be inhaling all of those fumes. I usually like to wear a mask as well, just to help protect myself from those. They're not fun to breathe in. I have one last tricky bit right through here that I'm going to try and get to. Um, it's mostly tricky because you have to get your brush down and in. With a lot of awkward bends and curves. So what I tried to do here, we'll see how it works, is I tried to get the center of the fireplace where there's lots of smoke and certain things mm -hmm. much darker than the rest. I think it's okay. We'll see how it looks when it dries. It's pretty shiny right now. Washers always come out very shiny when you first put them in. Um, and what a wash is, is just a very thinned down paint where it's uh maybe a little it, it it makes it more translucent it dries a little slower um and you can get nice shading with it done you can also let it seep into cracks and stuff with gravity in order to um create a lot more variation within a piece. So I almost always like finishing um, any given model with at least a little wash, you know, just a little to give it some pop and it makes it look more realistic. So like this piece right now is very bright and um, kind of like very, I don't know how to describe it other than very bright. Um, flat, I guess. Um, and sh the shading that you can get with um, a wash can really bring a lot of the little bends and curves in a piece out. So I find it quite valuable to use, but 
it does take a little practice to get good at it. But that's that's why you just keep doing it until you get until all you practice. Get it. So <laughs> let that dry and see how it turns out. What do you want to do with these chairs? Um, I would like to keep them fairly simple. Can I see mm -hmm. it? So we have these little barrel chairs. What I've done previously is I painted the seat here red, mm -hmm. like a cushion. Yeah. And then wood, wood on top, and then a metal band around the back Just here. Just a little metal band with a... Um, I would keep it simpler, though, going forward, and just do wood with a metal band. Oh, including the seat wood. Yeah, just yeah. Let it, rather than have a cushion on yeah. it, it's just a full yeah, wood. So the seat. metal band would just be where those little, like, those hobnail things are. Yeah, there's, there's like, you can see there's a band that goes okay. around. Well, I'm going to paint one of these, I guess. I'm going to paint the bottom first. I think I'm going to do this in the dark wood. The flat, flat brown? The flat brown. Or do you think that's too dark? Should I do it in maybe a light wood? I'd do it in a light wood. It might stand out a little better, and it will take the umber wash a little better. I could do it even in a buff. You think? Or do you uh, think yeah, buff is good. Buff is the color that this uh, stock is here. Mm -hmm. So when it gets an umber wash on it, it can get a very nice woody coloration. So there's all sorts of little nooks and crannies on this thing hard to hold on to. It's hard to hold. It has a lot more surface area than it feels like. Yeah, than it should. They're, they're, they're not like a huge pain to paint, but the chairs are more work than they look like. Yeah. I'm going to paint the metal band first, actually, and then I'll paint up to it, and then I'll retouch it. Okay. Um, what do you think? Steel? Brass? Copper? I would do brass or like uh, an iron that you wash down with, like, a black wash. Hmm. I think I'll do brass. Yeah, that seems fitting um, for fitting. Yeah. Fitting for fitting. That's I have to answer. find it. Okay. So I'm going to go rooting through this there's plastic a, bin. There's a brass and a bright brass in there, and I always found the bright brass is a little too... Too bright. Too bright for most things. And it gets really good for small fittings. Wow. That's your deal. Well, fireplace isn't bad. No, it's looking alright. Continue to let that dry. See how it turns out. Find another cup. Because all the rest of these have water in them from being cleaned. I am focusing in and getting in between all of these dogs. Yeah, you started the real project there. Yeah, this is a fairly complicated mushroom alien tree thing in a lot of ways. But it's coming along, and it shouldn't be too much longer here. Are those other two primed yet, or is that why they're there? Nothing over there is primed. Yeah, okay. I'll probably do a big priming session after today is mm -hmm. over. Because we have all these pieces that just got glued up. One drop of grass. Oh, we actually need this more than enough. Paint the little metal band um, that you can kind of see where the hobnails are around the back of the chair. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe the seat cushion. You know, if we wanted to, we'll see how it looks. Painting the seat cushion. Yeah, I would start by just painting it all one wood, and then, and then if you feel like it needs a little extra pop. Mm-hmm. We can always paint over the wood and add in like a. I did red on the previous ones, um, because I don't know red velvet seat or something. I kind of was like the vibe I got from it, but uh, I could easily see any color. 
I wouldn't do yellow. That's like 70s. That feels a little 70s. Yellow furniture. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't know. Nobody wants the 70s in their D and D session. Unless you're playing in the 70s. In which case, you were a fairly early adopter there. I was. Was that in the 70s that you mm -hmm. were doing that? Yep, it was. Probably like mid to later 70s. Mid to I was doing the show, yeah. The first DMD &D broadcast on public access cable. In the greater Wisconsin area? In Madison, Wisconsin. In Madison. I'm sure that there probably were like tens of people watching it. Mm-hmm. We had public access cable. I think it was either, I think it was either Friday or Saturday night, I forget when we did it. And, I we, and we started at maybe 9 o'clock, so. I remember watching public access. There was some weird stuff that got put on there. Even in the 90s. Yep. So in order for the audience to see the die rolls, because you know that was... Important. Important. There was only a D20. Um, they made a... Uh, like a wheel of fortune thing. <laughs> a big spinny wheel. A big spinny wheel, yeah. And so instead of rolling a die, which of course would have been invisible, went up and spun the wheel. That's pretty cute. Yeah, it was pretty good. No cheating on your die roll. We had two cameras. I'm almost through. Oh my veins here. You had two cameras. Mm-hmm. So, and a director. Who said camera one, camera two, camera one, focus on the wheel. <laughs> it was a, a no budget production. I mean, there was, well, there sort of was a budget because they brought pizza in. I don't remember. Uh, maybe we all chipped in for the pizza. We probably did. And they had university cameras, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were big, very big cameras. Like real cameras, but 1974 version cameras, the TV cameras. Uh huh. Okay, that brass actually looks pretty decent. But even with an umber wash, maybe to tone it down a little bit later. Yeah, I like to put a little umber on, on the brass. A lot of metallics get help from a little wash. They often are very, very bright on their own. And also a little glitter flake, you know? This off. Let's see if I can stick it if one foot. Yeah, I guess that'll hold. I, I think I just have this whole section left on this. And then I can start doing some weird shading. I think I'm going to need one more drop of uh, Scarlet here. There's some things I like about the Vallejo bottles, and there's some things I really <laughs> don't like about them. I like their uh, storability, for example. I like that it's easy to get just like a single drop out, because they basically just have a dropper top anyway. But it's you can't stir them particularly. The bottles are a little too uh, thin for that. Yeah, because it's just a little dropper hole. 
And I guess you could unscrew... No, you can't really no, unscrew no, that. You can't, you can't get to so, it. So you can't really get a lot. Like, one, once it's low, and you can't really get more out of the dropper, then you might have some wasted paint. Which I generally try to avoid. But, um... Vejo makes some really nice colors. Uh, the Tamiyas we use also make really nice colors, like this is a Tamiya here. Um, and the jars are easy to use, but the downside is that they're actually designed mostly for um, military models, uh, which is, I guess, a very large thing in Japan. Um, is sort of doing model painting and building of, sort of military vehicles. So you don't always have quite the range of colors available in Tamiya that you do in Vallejo. Um, so you, I, we sort of mix and match to get the best of both worlds. Because they, they work fairly similarly, similarly to one another, um, in the way they apply and the length of drying time and everything. So, for example, the base of this is Tamiya, the beige and the yellow, but the green and the red are Vallejo. In this particular bizarre example. Still trying to think what color the ground's gonna be. Poison. Poison color? Mm. What? What is poison color? <laughs> mm. Maybe a sort of a bluish color. That sort of like really that signal light, that you're on a weird alien planet. Like that light blue, maybe, with a light sea gray. Oh, the sea gray might be nice, yeah. We're looking at the color chart. In order to tell what color you're really getting. Because sometimes paints dry a different color than they are in the bottle. Yeah, Wet. and the bottle caps aren't necessarily accurate. Uh, we like to paint out little swatches on a piece of paper, labeling them, of course, so you can remember what's what, and then you see what they look like when they're actually dry. You can even put some washes over those swatches to get ideas of, like, what is this going to look like with a black wash on it or an umber wash on it. Things like that. Um, But I think I have my weird trunk done. What do you think? I think I should have uh, painted the metal band second. And I guess I will. <laughs> you seem to be in a, you, you seem to be having an ordering problem today mm -hmm. with your paint colors. Yeah, well, I haven't painted a chair before. No, I know. And a little or, or or a fireplace. No, and there's little indentations and things that needed to be painted the wood color that couldn't really see when it wasn't painted. So I'm on the stage now where I'm gonna start shading this, and that's gonna tone down all of the bright flatness of this whole piece. Um, this alien mushroom tree. I'm going to start with the bulbs because some of the trunk is still drying. Um, and my plan is to look through our pile of things. And, and I have this. It's a green wash. Um, 
This is a wash, a dark green wash to be precise. Um, this is one that we used in mm -hmm. our sewer set. We did a lot of sewer fighting in our D and D stream. Um, kind of mid to early on in it. Mm -hmm. um, giant rats. You know, it's the classic spiders. It's slime. like the classic D and D RPG thing is going through a sewer. And so we did. And we did that. Um, and we had a lot of fun making that sewer set. I'm not sure if we made that before or after we started streaming, though. Hmm. I think it was after. But yeah, maybe actually, I don't remember. I'm going to get a little pot of this green wash here. And I'm actually going to use this smaller brush because I do not want to make this like a. I don't want to just coat it with a uniform amount of green wash. And I'm going to start on the green veins that I've painted and sort of try and build out from there. Just a little closer. A lot of um, washing, especially if you're doing shading, is about controlling brush volume. So if you're finding there's a little too much um, wash on my brush, you can dab some off. And I want to sort of build up a darker area nearer to, nearer, closer, closer to the veins. Um, so you can see just from that little area how much of a difference some green wash is making to the, the color of the bulb. So that's what I'll be working on probably for the rest of our time here. And I'm actually, because wash um, absorbs very quickly into a brush because it's so wet, I actually dab a little back off the brush before I start painting. And that's just to control the volume of, uh, of wash on any given part of the brush. And I'll be giving the stock the same treatment as I go on. Um, <laughs> you can see when I hold it upside down, this is actually printed in a blue PLA. Oh, a little behind the scenes bottom shot there. So here's the area I'm sort of painting right up here. And I'm trying to get this sort of, I want the center and certain spots to let the yellow shine through a little more in between the veins um, is sort of what I'm going for. So I'm just going to keep building that out. Oh, okay. It is fairly subtle, and it's a good color on it, but it uh, tones down 
the bright yellow. The intensity of nicely. the yellow. Yeah. I think more of these are to be painted in the future. Uh -huh. Doing the wood first and then the metal band because the metal band is the one with the edges. And it took a long time to paint up to the metal band and it still made a mess. Uh -huh. So one can just use a big brush and slap the paint on. And then work the metal over and the then top. Work the metal, yeah. Otherwise, these things take too long, and a bigger brush would be good too because of all these little holes. And yeah, there's a lot of uh, hidden volume in those chairs. Yeah. Just talking about commercializing them. Uh huh. It would be. Yeah, much easier. Yeah, they could they could be painted pretty quickly if if it were done that way. As a side by side, you can see how quickly just some shading changes the vibe of the whole piece. Um, and that's what I'm going for. I want I want to sort of build in a bit more of the organic nature of this thing, an alien mushroom tree. I want some lighter spots, some darker spots. I don't want it to be uniform as I go. Um, sort of subtly building out all of that. Using the veins that I've painted in previously as sort of a guide for where darker and lighter should be. Yeah, that lighter color looks okay. Yeah, no, that's looking nice. And I think with a subtle umber brushing on it, you could get a very nice looking chair. And one thing you can do when you're doing anything shading wise is like on this chair, for example, maybe the back edges are going to be a little more worn or darker because they might collect more dirt than the uh, front where it will maybe be a little more worn down and newer looking because like more wood is exposed from friction just people getting up and out of it over time things like that you can sort of build out a story for the piece And this is sort of slow, gradual work when I'm working on, on this part here, but you can really see the sort of payoff if you compare this one to the area I've painted already. It just, it feels more realistic. Even if the subject is not particularly realistic in its actual shape and design.
I'm just going to tackle this one bulb at a time, basically. That's going to be the best way to do it. But this is a fun little amusing side project. Well, um, when I have some spare time, you know, something that doesn't have any pressing need to get it out the door aspect to it. Okay, so there, use an unwashed chair and I'm going to let that dry a little bit and then uh, play with some umber wash. I'm holding it, so no problem now. I buried it in the sticky goo here. Now I've got sticky goo. Sticky goo on the feet. <laughs> Small pieces like that especially um, become difficult to handle. <coughs> yeah, Alexis doesn't find us include these in sets. Uh, only as maybe an extra booster. Mm. Yeah. But that would be about, that would be a, it wouldn't be in a base set. Okay. Okay. Oh. So this fireplace is dried now. I think. Yeah. I'm liking the soot in there. That's looking nice. I feel like the one thing it could use, maybe, is a little bit of... You, know, you want to air between being realistic and graphic, but maybe like a real thin black line along the division. Yeah, of, along the bottom? See that the the division of the stone and wood, mm -hmm. just like a super fine black line to help visually separate it. Okay, like right at the right along the edge of it. Right along the edge of the wood and the stone, just to give it mm -hmm. some subtle visual separation without like reading as anything in particular. So. Or a little black wash, maybe. Yeah, just take a very tiny amount of black wash with, like, your smallest brush. Mm hmm And just gently put that along it. I think that might just uh, give it a little more sense of depth. Well, we'll see what happens. The worst that can happen is just end up painting it again. You don't have to if you don't want no, to. No, I'll give it a try. Just a, just a suggestion. So I have this teeny little brush like the one that Nicole likes to use. Uh-huh. But I use this one a lot. Yeah, I'm going to try to get it right there. I do a lot of extremes with my brushes. It's either little brush, or smaller, or giant brush. I don't. I don't usually do in between that much. It's a way not small line. And I would actually dry your brush off almost completely after getting the wash on, mm -hmm. just to have like. A the smallest amount you can on on it. The smallest amount is none. Well, that is always the option, isn't it? But the the primary issue with dry brushing a uh, wash is that when it's in that small of a volume, it has a tendency to dry almost immediately. So you have to be kind of quick if you're going to do it. It's kind of a funny, weird line. Don't have to walk. I really signed up for a lot of work with this tree, didn't I? Yes, 
Is that what you had in mind? On the left side. Yeah, it just gives you a very subtle visual, like, break. Mm -hmm. From one piece to the other. You know what I mean? And it might not even be all that visible on camera. One nice thing I'll put in the wash on top is that it, I feel like, almost gives the veins more of a subsurface feel to them. Um, like they're, they're sitting there just below the surface rather than sort of floating above it. Because it puts this cohesive layer over everything. Yeah, I think I may have accomplished. Yeah, that's looking good. It just gives you this little break, mm -hmm. visual break. Yeah, it does. It highlights that. But it doesn't look like that someone's put a piece of tape or something Yeah. in between the two. Yeah, and it follows kind of the rough edges of the stone and the wood. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so do you see any more highlighting of any of the other stone or wood anywhere? Um, if you want when it's dry, the one part that looks like it might be a little flat is the stone. And what I would actually do is, um, do you mind? Mm-hmm. Just take this slight brush, get, get it loaded with some black wash, leave it on its back, and follow the lines, and just, well, just get it, like, wet, and make dark areas so it's more mottled and broken up, and that'll seep into the cracks naturally while mm -hmm. it's on its back, and it'll dry in to those cracks. Mm -hmm. so you're almost, like, depositing it on, on the stone. And you can even, yeah, dab away the higher part, the raised parts, mm -hmm. to lighten them. Just like, almost like twist your, uh, twist your paper towel into like a little tip, and you can just suck away the highest parts. And that will help build some like variation and contrast into the stone itself. But you won't want to tilt it forward. You want to keep it on its back or else gravity will pull pull it all down into like the wood and stuff you know washing is my favorite part so I end up doing it more often than you do you know mm -hmm. yeah and I like to Play with the uh, different textures and everything. Mm -hmm. Like I might be done washing this bulb before we're done, but you can see how subtle a difference it is. 
and just tones down that brightness. And that'll help a lot in the trunk as well, which feels very intense right now. But as I build in that darker wash along it, it will bring the whole thing a little more cohesive down and more cohesive with itself. One thing I've also done with the wash, I don't know how visible it will be on camera, is uh, I've let it seep into this spot where it joins the two, and it helps create a very thin, dark line to help you visually separate the two um, separate bulbs from one another. Another thing you can do with a wash is let it dry and then add another layer and it will darken it further to the color of the wash. You can actually sort of build up layers over time. If you need an area that's all considerably darker than others. Um, And while it's wet, it's quite malleable, but once it's dry, you pretty much would just have to repaint if you want to change it. So, you can maybe tell here, but I have finished this upper bulb. Uh, just getting it darkened and more cohesive compared to the others. Um, getting a lot of light there. What do you think? Yeah, I like that. So, that's generally what I'm going to be doing during my downtime until I get through all of them. I might hold off on the big bulb here for now. I might just tackle one of these smaller, smaller ones at the moment. Just for my own sake. Yeah, do you like that better? Yeah, that's looking good. And I, it adds some um, texture. Mm -hmm. I feel like, don't you think? Yeah, I've been, so I've been basically darkening the area between the, between the stones. The stones. Yeah, it helps bring out some of the variation in the print mm -hmm. a little more. Because it so looks a little, little monolithic when it was even toned down.
And now that I have a general idea, I'm going a little quicker. After my test one. Also, this one's a considerably smaller ball. <sighs> but, I'm not sure about you, I'm starting to lose my concentration. Well, as well you should with those <laughs> tiny little lines you were doing. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm cool. going to start wrapping up. Yeah, yeah, it's almost time. It's just about five. I might end slightly early today, so that I have time to do all of the dungeon, the new dungeon set, the Magic Shop Heroes um, tiles. I need to spray them all down with the airbrush, get them primed and ready for painting, um, which will be... Uh, we'll be doing the painting on them, most likely on Tuesday. Tuesday. So like our next, uh, our next place? art stream is Tuesday, um, 3 p.m. Eastern, so feel free to check us out then. Um, our next main stream is going to be our primary D&D &D show, which airs at 2 p.m. this Sunday. Um going to explore deeper into this mysterious island we're on and um yeah otherwise thank you everyone who yeah, came and checked out in. um if you want we have our patreon up and running now patreon.com forward slash dice and dungeons mm -hmm. otherwise follow us here on twitch on youtube all of that helps um a whole bunch and we're gonna just keep pushing it out yep. plenty of content for you all to enjoy and you'll see these come alive next week yeah so thank you everyone thanks and we will see you then bye